Support for Faith on Trial and Iowa Catholic Radio provided in part by Imogene Ingredients. Our freedom of conscience and religion is being challenged by laws and regulations imposed by secular society. It's time to hear from the top Christian litigators in the nation who have come forward to tell us the truth and help us defend our faith. Hear ye, hear ye. All rise. Faith on Trial with Defender of the Faith, Deacon Mike Menno is in session. And welcome to Faith on Trial. We examine the influence of law and society on people of faith. I'm Deacon Mike Manor, your host, and I'm here in the studio with Gina No, our lovely and talented co-host. Good morning, Deacon Mike. How are you? I'm just fine. I'm just fine. Have an interesting program prepared today. I think yes. uh, we have two great guests. Uh, one is, uh, where's my thing here? One, uh, which order we have men? Oh, I got it here. Um, we're going to have Mike Gonzalez, who is a a senior fellow at the Heritage Institute, and he's going to be talking about some of the problems with uh, George Soros, who I think everybody uh, knows who George Soros is, but uh, he's buying up a bunch of radio stations, and there seems to be some problems about how that passed through the FCC so quickly and without certain safeguards to it. And uh, and then we're going to talk with Chris Ferrara, who is a senior counsel with the Thomas More Society, about a rather convoluted but very disturbing case about how government is trying to intimidate one woman and her family, uh, and uh, it seems to be working thus far. And uh, Chris is just back from uh, argument with the uh, uh, Court of Appeals. So uh, we'll find out what is going on there. And then there's a lot of excitement in the air these days for the election. I can't tell you how many people have asked me, where and how to vote and how to register. And I'm thinking, oh, my gosh, we're less than two weeks. And you should have been thinking about this a long time ago. Let's yeah, see what was we can it? do. A couple of years ago, somebody um, remarked it's kind of a joke. You know, uh, Democrats uh, vote on Wednesday and the Republicans vote on Tuesday. And uh, they got into a lot of trouble with that. And so we won't uh, we won't try it. We all vote in the same day. Right. Although I have voted. We're, there is early voting here, and I have voted. Um, let me tell you what uh, what concerns me right now. Uh, two days ago, uh, Kamala Harris, the Democratic nominee for president, uh, came out with a position that she, if elected, is going to uh, draft her own pro-abortion bill, uh, and it's going to be applicable to all the states. It's going to basically be uh, Roe versus Wade. That's, I suppose, a political position, and uh, and you could understand her saying that because you know she's on the pro-abortion side of the ledger. What bothers me is she has indicated now that there will be no religious exception in her bill. That means that Catholic health care workers may be forced to do abortions or lose their job and their license. And... Um, Catholic hospitals may be put in the same position. And as far as I am concerned, that's beyond the pale right now. She's crossed the Rubicon there, and that disqualifies her really from almost any office, but especially the presidency. Gina? Especially for Catholics. I I know some people will match that up with uh, Trump's support for um, federally funded IBF and with no exceptions. And... um, I think he can be swayed. I don't think he understands how religious liberty affects that. So yeah. the, the, by comparison, that's it's different. The difference is between the two of them is Trump is not forcing anybody to do anything that they have conscientious objection to, whereas... Well, except uh, pay for IVF treatment. Except pay for the IVF, well, uh, through the, the insurance, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but it's a little bit different than forcing a practitioner to do something that he doesn't want to do. And she calls it a fundamental freedom, and I really believe that the First Amendment is more of a fundamental freedom, our ability to practice our faith. So. Read the First Amendment. Right. Read the First Amendment. Exactly. Religion is listed first, okay? Uh, do you have a, a uh, prayer to open us with? 
I closed it. Is that terrible? Uh, So it's a prayer for peace today. God of peace, bring your peace to our violent world. Peace in the hearts of all men and women and peace among the nations of the earth. Turn to your way of love those whose hearts and minds are consumed with hatred. Strengthen us all in hope and give us the wisdom and courage to work tirelessly for a world where true peace and love reign among the nations and in the hearts of all. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, Gina. And we'll be right back after these messages with Mike Gonzalez. In the meantime, you are listening to Faith on Trial on the Iowa Catholic Radio Network. Hey, welcome back. You're still listening to Faith on Trial on the Iowa Catholic Radio Network. And we have with us right now Mike Gonzalez, who is from the Heritage Foundation, one of our favorite fellows from the Heritage Foundation. Uh on a topic that uh, kind of maybe seem like it seems like it's a little bit out of our bailiwick here, but it has to do with George Soros. I think everybody knows who George Soros is, and I'm sure Mike can tell us all about him, uh, is obtaining uh, several hundred radio stations and has been approved to do so by the federal communications system. So let's turn it over to Mike, and, and can you first of all explain to us who George Soros is for anybody that doesn't know, and uh, why this may be concerning. Well, first of all, thanks a lot for having me here. I always like to uh, to speak to you. It's always a very enjoyable experience. Uh, George Soros. Tell that is, to my wife, will you? That speaking to me is such an enjoyable experience. <laughs> uh, sir, I can't help you there. I've also been married a quarter century, so I appreciate where you are. <laughs> But, but listen, George Soros is a, a Hungarian-American billionaire, super billionaire, a very rich man, born in in Hungary uh, during World War, and, and he lived there as a as a teenager during World War II, then came to the U.S. has become an American. Uh, he is an American. Nobody nobody says you know nobody, nobody takes that away from him. Uh, so he is entitled as an American to own radio stations. In this country, um, you know, we have the FCC, the Federal Communications Commission, does have rules uh, for foreign ownership. Uh, he himself, there's no problem with him buying radio stations. He is a very leftist man, a very leftist man who, I mean, when I say leftist, I don't mean that he wants higher higher taxes than you or me, or that he that he you know, he, he likes busing or anything like that. I mean, he is on the far left. He is very pro-abortion, very uh, pro-transgender rights. He wants to, um, he buys into all of the new left, uh, gender and racial theories. Um, so, and, and he will move, he will use his billions uh, around the world to uh, achieve his uh, leftist agenda. Well, now he's, the, he's the architect of a lot of these uh, left-wing prosecutors, isn't he? Yes, that's right. He decided in around 2015, I wrote a book on, on, on Black Lives Matter. Black Lives Matter changes the country a lot and with his push against the, the law and order, against law enforcement. And he decides that the way to help this, this, this push against law enforcement and law and order is to support prosecutors who will not prosecute. So he supported about 20 uh, what we call pro- rogue prosecutors. Who, who will not enforce the law, who will not prosecute criminals. Um, and that, is, that has caused a lot of damage to society. But in this case, in the case of the radio stations that we're discussing, he puts together a, a, a consortium of, um, uh, of, of, of uh, financiers to buy a, a, a radio, a, a number of radio stations that are owned by Odyssey. Odyssey is uh, has a has a uh, Odyssey Inc. Um, has hundreds of radio stations in uh, I think 40 media markets, reaching 165 million Americans. So this is reaching um, more than half the country, just over half the country, in 40 major media markets. Um, and he proposes that uh, Odyssey was in dire straits financially at the beginning of the year. It, uh, it went through Chapter 11 um, reorganization, and it came out that the people who held, who, who, who held um, 
who had loans, who, who had who had uh, loaned the money to Odyssey, turned out in the reorganization to that turned into equity, and he became him and his group became the largest uh, owners. The question, and there are several questions here. One of them is that in that consortium of financiers that he put together to buy the loans, to buy the debt, uh, there are a lot of foreign entities, and that would have required the FCC to look into uh, who they are uh, for national security reasons. These are very good laws that we have in this regard. And that was skipped. That was skipped. The Democrats on the FCC voted to, to fast-forward this. Uh, the last thing I will say, we can pick a, on any of this if you want, but I, I, I'll stop speaking now, is that the Republican-appointed commissioner, Brendan Carr, uh, raised concerns. Uh, he went to Congress and said, uh, this is a, uh, I'm going to quote him directly, quote, the FCC is not following its normal process for reviewing a transaction. And he said, we have established for a number of years how you get approval from the FCC uh, when you have an excess of 25% ownership. And that transaction obviously does. Um, so the FCC should have uh, sat on this, should have investigated, should have looked at it. It did not do this, and it green-lighted the purchase. And now the Oversight Committee of the House of Representatives is investigating why the FCC fast-tracked such a deal. Okay, let, let, let's go back to the vote in the FCC. It's not, my understanding is there are five commissioners, three Democrat, two Republican, and that's how they split on this vote three to two, Democrat versus Republican, to f fast forward this. Is that correct? Yeah, that's right. That's, uh, you know, all these agencies, I used to work for the Securities and Exchange Commission myself, uh, and they're governed by boards that have uh, that have a bare majority uh, on the board of the president uh, elected by the American people. Okay. All right, so why the fast track? Has any answer come out about that? No. They, they just did it by fiat. They, they like George Soros. George Soros uh, is a friend of, of the Biden uh, House, or the Biden um, the White House. He's a friend of, of liberal causes. And uh, they just fast-tracked this because they had the power to do so, and they've given no explanation for it. So that's the, that, that becomes rich ground for Congress to investigate. Right, now, what is the authority of Congress uh, or anybody beyond the FCC to stop the purchase now? Or is it complete? Well, look, Congress has oversight mm -hmm. power over the, the, the executive. And the FCC, even though it's, a, it's an independent agency, we have these so-called independent agencies, the FCC, the SEC, etc. It really is, everybody's accountable, everybody should be accountable in a system of government. We live in a democracy. Uh, and, and, in fact, you know, we, we have to make sure one of the things that I think should happen is uh, if a conservative gains power again, we must make sure that the bureaucracy is accountable to the voter. Uh, so, so the FCC is accountable to Congress, and, and Congress is exercising its oversight responsibility by investigating this purchase, by investigating this restructuring, and by investigating uh, why the FCC acted in the manner that it did, uh, bypassing decades of, of, of norms. Is there a way for the uh, sale to be stopped at this point? There's always a way, right? Okay. Especially if Congress uh, says this is this was not passed the smell test. Obviously, the whole country is is, is suspended animation here. We're all waiting to see what happens on November fifth. Uh, it could go one way, it could be the other. The election is very close, um, but I think what happens on November fifth will determine, in the long term, in the medium term, really a lot of these things. Okay. <clears throat> now, what is the fear of Soros' ownership? Uh, we know that uh, there's people there with over 25 percent, who own over 25 percent of this corporation, this new corporation now, uh, that are foreign entities. Uh, we know what Soros' track record is and how he has uh, and his um, uh, prosecutors have really failed law enforcement in this country. So what are we concerned about with him owning these radio stations now? 
Look, there's two things, right? One, as conservatives, we should always be very concerned with anything with Soros, anything that Soros owns. Soros is, is going to wants to turn the country in a very far left manner uh, to 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 policies that are inimical to to American interests, to conservative uh, the conservative view of life. But okay, having said that. He has every right to use his money any way he wants to, right? I'm, I'm, uh, you have to be an absolutist about this. You know, Americans have the right. He owns his money. He's able. If he wants to buy things. He has that right. However, if he has a corporation that includes uh, a, a, a an amount of foreign ownership that goes over the the limit that the FCC has traditionally used as the triggering mechanism for investigating for national security reasons, exactly just for national security reasons, then that is a concern, and, and, and the concern should be, um, you know, we should look into it. Um, that, that is all. You know, that is all. This is nobody saying that, that, that Soros doesn't have a, the right as an American to do these things. What we're saying is it's not, it's not about Soros. It's about the foreign entities that are part of this, uh, this consortium. Okay. Now, do we know the names of these people? No, I don't think we do. Okay. And that is, um, well, we, you know, they, they, they should be fleshed out in the investigation. Okay. Now, I take it then in an investigation uh, for national security purposes, they would obtain the names of these people, where they're from, and what their uh, uh, geopolitical identity is? Yeah, I, I, somebody might know this. I mean, I, I don't know their names. I don't think they're public yet. I could be wrong about this. But we do know that there is a, a great deal of for, foreign ownership. Um, I Look, it's, we have adversaries in the world. The Chinese especially have been very adept at, at uh, using the financing of Hollywood studios to try to change the mind of the electorate on key issues. Uh, we all know, uh, because it's, you know, there's been accusations all the time about uh, uh, Russia meddling in our, in our electoral system, and Russia does try to meddle in our, in our electoral system. We know also, for example, that Iran uh, is involved. The, the, the Justice Department itself, you know, um, Eric Garland's and, and Joe Biden's Justice Department has told that Iran is trying to influence the election uh, in, in favor of Kamala Harris. And they're trying to kill Trump. Trump. Yeah. Yeah. It does not want Donald Trump to be elected. You know, foreigners do not get a vote in our elections. They just don't. Especially, you know, we have to be, if, if, you, if you care about American interests, you have to make sure that uh, our adversaries, people who want us to fail, People who want America to do badly do not have a say in how the electorate looks at issues. Gina, did you have something? Oh, absolutely. Hi, Mike. Uh, Hi. I know we've seen, um, when we talk about what the implications will be, I know uh, in July Soros was able to purchase 18 Spanish-speaking stations um, in southern Florida, I think, a whole group of them. Um, because uh, the rumor was that he didn't like how they were um, giving such a conservative message on those stations, and he moved in to kind of squash that for the Hispanic population of southern Florida. So we know that he's actually taken that kind of control based on his previous actions. Um, Do we anticipate that he could either, A, shut down, I know there's a movement to shut down all AM stations, could he do something like that, or could he, for example, Rush Limbaugh is not on the air, but he covered, I mean, he was on multiple stations throughout the country. Could he shut down a program like a Rush Limbaugh show on the stations that he purchased? Well, already Mark Levin has been shut down in one of the stations owned by Odyssey. This is not a... a Since the purchase you know, by Soros, or did Odyssey do that on their own? Well, it happened. Odyssey did it on its own, but it's about to be, it's, you know, Soros is, is now a Soros' consortium is the majority ownership, has majority ownership of Odyssey. And that, that, that's already happened. 
so the, the, this is not a, 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 a you know something that is uh, uh, that we have to think about. Wonder if it will happen. That's already happened. Um, George Soros. We're talking about something that happened two years ago. Oh, two uh, years ago in George, in July. Yeah, okay. George Soros um, helped raise the financing for another consortium that bought um, that was put together to buy 18 Spanish language radio stations. Now the liberals are going berserk over the fact that the group that we inadvisedly call Hispanic, I, I don't use that term because I think it hides a lot of the um, a, a lot of the diversity inside the quote unquote Hispanic uh, category. Uh, people vote for very different reasons. Cuban Americans have a, a very different profile from Mexican Americans, and indeed Cuban Americans in South Florida have a very different profile. Um, than, than, than sure. Cuban American, but it's Spanish Jersey, speaking, right? Yeah, Spanish speaking. <laughs> For sure. And, and he, they're very concerned because all these groups have moved uh, to to the right, have moved, have become more conservative. Cubans have always been very conservative, but they they moved like really, you know, in a very big way. And so with Trump, uh, the last time I checked, uh, which is the 2020 election, I think something like like 75 percent of Cuban districts precinct in Florida voted for Trump, so that's indeed very high. But even at the left side of the spectrum, the, the, the Spanish-speaking groups that have been traditionally more liberal, the Puerto Ricans, have turned to the right as well. Uh, Puerto Ricans, for example, moving into Pennsylvania, mostly Puerto Ricans, uh, but, but, but not just Puerto Ricans, uh, have uh, into, into what is being called the, the Puerto Rican corridor that runs from Scranton to Harrisburg. Um, are registering GOP at a, at, a, at a larger rate than they have in the past. So that is, that is concerning the left. That's, the left is, is, is definitely afraid of this because they always saw that they owned, they always saw that they owned uh, the, 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 the Hispanic vote, and they're finding out that they don't. So what they're trying to do is, is buy these radio stations and, and trying to suppress conservative views. Now, I, I speak Spanish, so I'm often on Spanish language radio stations or TV uh, news channels, and I have kept tabs on one particular Miami radio station, which was bought by this uh, consortium that was financed by Soros, part of this financing, and that is uh, Radio Mambi. And they, they, they tried, I think, to turn it to the left, but they've they, they given up on it for the time being according to the people that I've talked to who work there. Uh, so they have not messed with it too much because it would have been a huge, a huge outcry in Miami, in the Miami Cuban community, which is very, very, very conservative. It's one of the most conservative groups in the country. Uh, and the, 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 the outcry would have been huge had they turned their favorite radio station to the left. Yeah. So they have kind of left it alone for the time being. Culturally, that's where the Hispanics are, conservative. I mean, the, the whole culture is more conservative than liberal. And I understand the Cubans, you know, that's a leftover from the Bay of Pigs and all that other stuff that, uh, that left them as Republicans there. So there's added reasons for those people, uh, specifically in that area of the country, uh, to uh, favor the other side. But uh, I think, and I think you'll agree, Mike, that uh, uh, overall, uh, the Hispanics, uh, however you want to, call them, are basically uh, more conservative in their culture than other groups. Well, yes and no. I mean, I, I, I would have to parse that, to be honest. Okay. I think, I think that they would, they're very pro-family, and I've, I've begun to study why that is. And, you know, the, 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 the way Latin America was created was, similar to the way Spain itself was created after the Reconquista, and the family played a very strong role in that. So maybe this is a carryover from that, this idea that the family, the, the, especially the nuclear family, the father, the mother, the, the children, are, are a very key thing, and that has conservative implications. On the other side, studies have been done that show that uh, Hispanics also are, uh, believe in bigger government than has been the American tradition, and bigger government spending. Now, curiously, conservatives are having their own debate about this, 
Um, many of my fellow conservatives, not me, but many of my, favorite, my, my fellow conservatives are beginning to question whether we should have a government a, a, action, um, government intervention on behalf of conservative values. I, don't, I think I think it's a mistake, but but it is happening. It, it is an open debate. So 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 it, it's a it's a more muddled question whether Hispanics, quote unquote, are conservative, quote unquote. And, and sorry, I, I know exactly what you were trying to say. I just happen to have uh, some disagreements with. Well, you. that's why we have you on because you know more than we do about some of these things, Gina. You. Well, were- I'm also hearing you say that. Um, back to your your previous point that um, it's important for us. Uh, the Congress can do what it what it'll do. Maybe it'll reverse this, but it's imp- radio is local. And it's important for us to express our support for the programs we love on our radio stations in the event that this, you know, takes a big hit. The, 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 the left, definitionally almost, feels that it must have a monopoly on the media. They can't stand when, when conservatives are able to discuss anything. And the fact that conservative talk radio... It's much, much more important. They, you know, leftist talk radio just doesn't exist. They're not exciting. They're not, it doesn't have a following. They've tried it in the past. It's always failed. Whereas we have great conservative hosts, Mark Levin. I've already spoke about Vince Colonnese. I've already spoke about Larry O'Connor, uh, Hugh Hewitt. You guys, you know, they have nobody. And they can't stand that. So what they try to do is to take it over buying it, and, 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 but what they're going to find out is they, they will have no audience because they've never had an audience. That's yeah. interesting. Yeah. 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 That, 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 we'll have to wait and see how this plays out. Yeah, we Thanks will, and I imagine discussion. there's going to be a lot of discussion in Congress, and depending on who's elected uh, the new president, uh, I would imagine uh, he'll uh, or she will weigh in on this, and uh, we'll wait and see what they say. Now, you're at the Heritage Foundation, and the Heritage Foundation uh, can be reached, I think, at heritage.org. Is that correct? Yeah, that's right. Heritage.org is where you can find all the good work that we do, all the, all the work that I do. My, my, I have a recent book. It's called Next Gen Marxism, What It Is and How to Combat It. My co-author is Catherine Gorka. Right, and we had her on in, uh, uh, yeah, oh, a while right. ago. Yeah, we had her on talk about that book. So, so, so that book was published in April, so seven months now. It is still selling very well. It's very strong. Next Gen Marxism, which explains a lot of the issues that we're seeing right now play out in this electoral season. Uh, and, 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 you know, I'm very active on social media, but I'm very happy that you guys gave me this opportunity to discuss these important issues with you. Oh, we're always happy to have you. You, uh, you open our eyes to a lot of things, and we appreciate that. We appreciate the heritage. A foundation. And I was just in the Vatican last month, and I met, uh, you know, your boss. Oh, good. <laughs> did you get a special blessing? I did. Good. I had uh, good. Groceries, which I gave to both my sons. You're good. on your way to that it. with you. All right. Yep. We're pretty much out of time now, so we've got to leave it there. But uh, uh, we hope that people will follow up, check out your book, check out the Heritage Foundation website. And uh, thank you very much for joining us, and God bless you, and God bless your work, and we will keep you in our prayers. Thank you very much. I really appreciate that. I will also keep you in my prayers. Thank you. Okay, Michael Gonzalez, who is the uh, fellow at the Heritage Foundation, and we will be right back after these messages. You're listening to Faith on Trial on the Iowa Catholic Radio Network. Welcome back. You're listening to Faith on Trial, the Iowa Catholic Radio Network, and we have Chris uh, Ferrara with us. He is counsel with the Thomas More Society, and he's got an interesting case, and I, I think, you're, uh, Chris, you're still waiting for a ruling back from the uh, Court of Appeals on it, but uh, it has to do with uh, polysexual posters in an elementary classroom, and I think that's what started this whole thing. So you want to bring us up to date on it? Well, this case arises in the context of a very disturbing trend in America, which is the process by which official narratives cannot be questioned. So if you question an official narrative, they call what you're saying hate speech, or they adopt the theory that, well, you could incite someone to act out violently because someone might be disturbed.
disturbed by what you say. You mean like just like very, shooting at the president or the former yeah, president? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and this theory has been given a fancy name, stochastic terrorism. What does that mean? Well, the word stochastic refers to randomly occurring events that cannot be predicted with accuracy, hence stochastic. So they call it terrorism because if you say something that's provocative, and this means essentially conservative opinions that the liberal narrative formulators don't like, that might provoke someone to act out violently. So what happened here? So it was a display in a school, an elementary school, on elementary school night in the hallway, obviously created by students. And these students were induced to make posters affirming various sexual identities, polysexual, queer, gender queer, homosexual, and so forth, and to write slogans on the posters, such as be who you are, don't let anyone tell you not to be who you are, or words to that effect. In other words, affirming these identities, about which these elementary school children probably didn't know anything unless they researched them on the Internet or were told about them by teachers. So these teachers were engaging these impressionable students in a program of affirming various supposed sexual identities, despite any contrary moral formation in the home. They were just undermining any contrary moral formation. So Angela was at the, the school night with two of her children. And uh, one of them asked her, uh, upon seeing this poster, what polysexual means. In other words, they don't know what these things mean. But the teachers wanted them to know what these things mean at a very impressionable age. So they were propagandizing these students. So when Angela got this question from her daughter, she was quite disturbed. So she went to a parent's Facebook group, a very big group, her favorite forum, in fact, on Facebook, 13,000 members, who expressed concerns about trends in education including this kind of nonsense. And she wrote a very reasonable Facebook post, basically saying you should always respect differences, but this is too much. You're exposing children to age-inappropriate material. This is perverse. You don't, you don't do this to children. I'm calling for respectful debate. The post was about as anodyne as you could ask for. It really said nothing particularly outrageous. It was just parental concern about age-inappropriate material and the attempt to inculcate these children in things they really shouldn't be discussing or even knowing about at that impressionable age. So what happened? Well, it turns out there was a fellow on the military base who was outraged by this, and he got his military base buddies to target Angela Redding for censorship and retaliation. How did they do it? Well, the anti-terrorism program manager got his partners in the New Jersey State Police Office of Regional Operations and New Jersey Department of Homeland Security to target the speech, to what we call threat tag it, so that it was deemed a potential threat to school security. But then in the meantime, the head of the uh, security division at the base induced a local police chief to call up the Facebook administrator, not Angela, but the Facebook administrator, who had never met Angela before, and get her to take it down. On the theory, as the police chief told her, that if she didn't take it down, there would be a school shooting, and she would be responsible for multiple deaths. So this was so intimidating to the Facebook administrator that during the phone call, being so intimidated, she took it down immediately. So the post was censored. And then all kinds of other actions followed. But the basic problem was they retaliated by, by casting her as basically a sort of domestic terrorist. And so we went to court on this. The judge denied us a preliminary injunction. We wanted an injunction to prevent them from further retaliation, to prevent them from further censorship, so that she could put the same post right back up again without interference from this posse of ideologues that has no understanding of First Amendment protected speech. She denied the injunction. We took it up on appeal. To okay, the, uh, let me sir. let me stop you right there and ask you a, a rather obvious question: Why was the injunction denied? What what reason well, did the, the judge give? Was, well, they haven't done anything lately, but of course they had done something lately. They had cast her, and I'm not getting into all the facts. I'm just giving you a, a brief sketch. Right. They had cast her as a threat to public safety and security. 
They had put her into the system through the New Jersey Department of Homeland Security and the New Jersey State Police Regional Operations Center. They have an anti-terrorism function. And through the military base, joint uh, the threat working group of the joint base, Dixon McGuire Lakehurst. They have a threat working group. And they plugged her into the threat working group operations, which includes the so-called partners as the program terrorism program manager said the partners being New Jersey State Police, New Jersey Homeland Security, and who knows who else in the government. So we end up arguing this case in the Third Circuit Court of Appeals. And the big issue is, well, what have they done lately? Why should you get an injunction if they haven't done anything lately? And the point is, they have already done more than enough to chill her speech so that she's afraid now to put the same post back up again. Because now it's obvious she's on a government watch list of some kind. And here's the proof of that. So just before oral argument, it turned out that when she goes to the airport, she's in the clear program. Clear program is where you give them biometrics. You scan your irises, you give them facial recognition and so forth, so that you can just walk right through the clear terminal into your gate and depart. No need to stop at the TSA. No need to show your identification. No need to have your bags um, taken out and put on the conveyor. You don't take your shoes or belt off because you're a trusted traveler. They call this the trusted traveler program. And you pay for that. So she provided the the biometrics. She became a trusted traveler. And everything was fine for for a long period of time until these retaliatory actions. And so she put up the Facebook post. Now, when she goes to the airport, every single time when she goes to the clear terminal, they flag her. They say, oops. You have to go to the TSA and identify yourself. Meanwhile, everyone else in her party who's in the CLEAR program just walks right to the gate because that's the whole point of the CLEAR program. You're CLEAR. You're across the traveler, but not her. So seven times in a row, as it turns out, because this happened again after oral argument, and we have brought both of these events to the Third Circuit's attention in motions to enlarge the record. She was flagged again and told she had to report to the TSA. And the clear people say, well, this is coming out of Homeland Security. It has nothing to do with the clear program. So this time, after oral argument happened three more times, she took a picture of the screen at the clear terminal. One of the screenshots shows the word ineligible with a warning sign, you know, the famous triangle with the exclamation point Mm -hmm. inside it. So now she's on a watch list and deemed apparently ineligible for the clear program, even though she goes to the clear terminal or the kiosk to be cleared. So obviously they have done things in the government machinery that have yet to be uncovered, which have resulted in her being declared a security threat and flagged. And she has been stripped of her trusted traveler status. Now, an interesting development at the oral argument was that even if the issue of whether she should get an injunction is up in the air right now, the three-judge panel was rather merciless in attacking the government for what they did to this woman. At one point, they demanded that the government attorney read to them from this Facebook post that started the whole thing anything that they considered threatening, and they weren't able to... produce even a copy of it. The attorney said, I don't have it with me. What? It's the basis of the whole lawsuit. So the judge, one of the judges said, let me help you. And he read a passage from the Facebook post in which basically Angela says, I respect differences. Differences should be respected, but we need to have a rational discussion about this. And the judge said to him, what does that have to do with a school shooting in Colorado? They were not buying the government's ridiculous theory that speech that could anger some people should be considered terrorism. That is not what the First Amendment says. In fact, the whole purpose of the First Amendment is to provide ample room for speech that precisely might anger some people because it is provocative. And this wasn't all that provocative. It was just an objection to material that was age-inappropriate in a school. That, that's, so that's that seems saying, to be uh, the... It's a cutting-edge case. Yeah, that seems to be the mantra today, is that if you don't agree with us, it's hate speech and it's going to cause 
uh, all this chaos. Yeah, it's a whole new theory. Mm-hmm. Again, they call it stochastic terrorism to make it sound fancy. In other words, some random person stochastically might be angered and, and take violent action because he doesn't like what he reads. It's, it's this... But that's not what the First Amendment prohibits. The First Amendment prohibits incitement. But incitement is you call for violence. You say, let's go to the White House and burn it down. Let's do it now. Or I think I'm going to uh, incite this crowd to mob the courthouse. Or I I call upon so-and-so to assassinate the president. That's incitement. It's a call for imminent lawless action. This doesn't even enter that universe. It's in a different universe. That universe is called protected speech. Well, we, so the three-judge panel wasn't buying this ridiculous theory. They were pretty angry with what the government has done here. So the only issue is, do we get the injunction? And my view is that obviously what they've done here is they have stripped her of her trusted traveler status. They've depicted her as a, a domestic terrorist. And here's the problem for her in particular. She's an attorney admitted to the New Jersey bar. Now, you imagine how you would feel if you were newly admitted to the New Jersey bar looking for employment, and they put you on a government watch list because of a Facebook post they didn't like. That's how scary this whole governmental trend is. Well, so and, you know, depending on how the next election turns out, it's only going to get worse. Yeah. We'll end up with an EU-style hate speech regime where anything that the government doesn't like could result in your literal imprisonment. That's, that's a real concern among the attorneys mm-hmm. at the Thomas More Society the way this trend is moving. So the whole thing began because a military official saw this post. What I'm wondering yeah, is... the military is, official uh, has a personal animus. Somewhere in the, uh, in the paperwork, the public... The reason we discovered this is we were able to get an email chain because the military base officials, uh, foolishly but fortunately for us, included New Jersey state officials, including the police chief and the school superintendent, in their email communications about this dastardly Facebook post. So all of those emails, which they could have hidden from us as military emails, and try getting a federal FOIA request on it, that would have taken years, those emails became state records because state officials were in the email chain. So we used the Open Public Records Act to get all these emails, and the emails are smoking guns, every one of them. So in these emails, you find out that the one who started this off was boasting about how he is the proud father of an LGBTQ student. So he's got a motive. Mm-hmm. How dare anyone criticize these different sexual orientations? One of his sons supposedly exhibits one of these orientations. So he's personally involved, and he basically conducted a jihad with his military buddies using the local police chief as their cat's paw, and in conjunction with the school superintendent, to get this Facebook page removed. And then, as he put it, to keep the pressure on, I'm quoting one of his emails, until her, meaning Angela's, dangerous and divisive action cease. What does he mean by dangerous and divisive action? Speech. Protected speech that he doesn't like. So what they all did together, and the conspiracy has shown every jot and tittle of it from public records, what they did together was to suppress speech they didn't like, and then punish the author of the speech. And now we see she can't even go to the airport without being treated as a potential terrorist. It's really unbelievable what happened. Yeah, it certainly is. And it's kind of a convoluted story, but it's one of those things that I suppose, in reality, this is happening all over almost every day. Something like this is happening. And uh, especially with this administration, I know, you know, they're investigating the Catholic Church now, Latin Mass Catholics. And, uh, uh, everybody seems to be getting investigated if you don't agree with uh, what the prevailing wisdom is, if you can call it wisdom, in the current administration. This is what we're worried about, that people of conservative orientation, and you're speaking of the investigation of Catholics, that mm-hmm. happened out of the Richmond field office. Well, we had uh, Kyle Saracen, uh, Serafin, yeah. the uh, whistleblower on, yeah. That's right. So it, it, it's an alarming trend, and it's, it's, uh, it's got to be arrested. So we're hoping we get a reversal of the district court's refusal to grant an injunction. 
Uh, and if we don't, then we'll go back. We'll try the case to the end and seek a permanent injunction, because what was denied here was a preliminary injunction. So we still have the right to litigate the case to the end and seek permanent injunctive relief and any damages that might be appropriate because of this conspiracy. And I think the damages are significant here because and this is a, an attorney whose life was basically ruined mm-hmm. by this posse of constitutional incompetence, total ideologues who couldn't tolerate speech that departed from their approved official narrative. And they are all apparently acting. And they're all apparently acting on behalf of the state. Oh, every yeah. one of them. Mm-hmm. All in their official capacity. Mm-hmm. It isn't as if they, you know, if they suppose they had put up their own Facebook post. They could have done that. They could have said, "We think Angela Redding is full of hot air." We think Angela Redding. They, could, they even could have said in their private capacity, just as citizens, "We think this speech is dangerous." Well, that's their opinion. It's a ridiculous opinion. But they could have expressed it as citizens. But no, they used the power of their office to censor the speech, to get it removed from Facebook. And now, because of all of their activities, Mrs. Redding will not go back onto Facebook. She's abandoned it. And that was the, her most beloved forum. Yeah. Now, all she has is this little private blog where she stays away from the third rail subject that got her in hot water with these clowns, as they call them, in the first place. And now she just writes about some general subjects, and she'll, she'll write about the case, too, defending her position in this case. How soon so, are you expecting a, a ruling from the circuit court? It's impossible to say. Yeah. Because with, with circuit courts of appeal, it could be three months, it could be six months, it could be a year. We just don't know. We're hopeful, but I don't want to predict the outcome. I, know. I, I do know that the government's theory was not sitting well with that panel. And that's the way it should have been. It, yeah. this, this whole affair is utterly ridiculous. But again, it's typical of this governmental trend, uh, focusing on conservative opinions and depicting them as terrorism. It's happening everywhere, as you just noted. Yeah. I noticed that she's a member of that school board for that particular school. Also, how are the other board members treating her and what kind of support is she getting from other parents? Well, the local school board, her husband was a member of that. She was a member of the regional school board. And one of the results of their retaliation, this included stirring up the public against her at a school board meeting. One of the results of that was that they both had to resign from their school board positions, she from the regional board and the husband from the local board. Uh, I believe the husband has since run for office again and been reelected, but she's never going back on the board. She, she doesn't want to tolerate a situation in which she's depicted as a terrorist, and now she can't even fly uh, to various locations without being specially checked, as if she were a terrorist. So their actions, so that, whether you win... as a public official is basically over right now. Yeah, and so the actions of the these uh, law enforcement individuals had its chilling effect. She has felt she never wants to be in the situation again, and she won't express her opinion. No, and why, why would she? I mean, who would in that situation? Exactly. And not only that, we this is possibly the tip of an iceberg. This became manifest at the airport, where she was basically stripped of her trusted traveler status. But who knows what else is going on? Does the FBI have a file on her? Is she I'm under sure they do. Kind of surveillance? Mm-hmm. And what if she publishes these opinions again? Will they ramp up their investigation, start new investigations? Uh, who, who knows what will happen? Uh, she's already lost two job offers because of this affair. I won't go into the details of those, but they were both completed offers. She was ready to start, and they were yanked after this. Well, this is certainly uh, an example of government intimidation. Uh, Yeah, they set out to ruin her life, mm -hmm. essentially. And this is why... uh, They succeeded over nothing, over a Facebook post that anyone had the right to put up. This is why people like the Thomas More Society is out there to... uh, protect people, protect their religious liberties, and um, we see this all the time on this program. That's, uh, let me uh, make sure I have the, uh, the thing right here. It's thomasmoresociety.org if somebody wants to contact the organization, find out more about what's going on. You know, they've become a real powerhouse in the area of First Amendment liberties, both right. freedom of speech and freedom of religion. They're doing fantastic work, and it's a real honor that I'm 
part of their organization as senior counsel. So I would urge everyone listening to this to send them support, support them any way that you can, because it's going to be especially important as the, the events unfold and, in this country that we have defenders of the First Amendment. And, and that's what I always point out as an attorney myself. I know what litigation costs, and oh. I know that uh, none of this is done free. It all costs somebody something, but it doesn't cost the clients of Thomas More. So the only way That's that right. we can one, help... One of the reasons we're winning is that this has become a professionalized uh, occupation. Yeah. Before, when you had a Catholic who was under persecution by government officials, you would have to rely on pro bono attorneys who had their own practices and were trying to support families, so they couldn't really devote themselves full-time to this kind of work. But over the last 25 years or so, uh, Thomas More Society and other public interest law firms have upped the ante, and now there's a very professional response at the level of the biggest law firms to these attacks on the rights of Catholics and other Christians, especially in the area of First Amendment liberties. So now we have these public interest law firms, Thomas More is preeminent among them, that do a very professional job at no cost to these clients and are achieving significant victories in this in, in this area. So, yes, I would urge everyone to. And, and, th- and yeah, and this is why I, I urge people to uh, support them whenever they can. If they've got a few uh, extra coins laying around and they want to send them uh, to Thomas More's way, uh, I'm sure you can find a place on the uh, uh, web page there to do so. It's Thomas More, M O R E, society.org. You can do that and you can find out what Chris and the others are doing there. We've had Thomas More Society on the program many times, and uh, it amazes me uh, what you guys are doing. And we certainly appreciate you coming and telling us the story, and um, we appreciate you, appreciate Thomas More Society. Thank you for coming, and God bless you uh, and uh, the whole society. Thank you, and God bless you for uh, the invitation, and it was a privilege to be on your show. Thank you, Chris. We will be right back after these messages. You're listening to Faith on Trial now with Catholic Radio Network. And we're back. Gina, we had a uh, another uh, interesting program, and this one was very interesting, both the topics here with uh, Mike Gonzalez and George Soros and uh, Christopher Farrar and the... Uh, well, it problems just, his client is having. Yeah, they both stories uh, exemplify the chilling power that we've uh, given our bureaucracy and executive branch, and some changes need to be made, and I would encourage everyone to vote this uh, week from Tuesday. That's right. That's right. Or before. There's open voting in some places now. Yeah, don't now. forget to vote. Yeah, just don't forget to vote. Too much is at stake, and we are... Unfor- all the way down the ballot. Yeah. Let me remind you, all the way down the ballot. All the way down the ballot. And we are out of uh, time here, so uh, let us end with our defender's prayer. St. Michael the Archangel, defend us in battle. Be our protection against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, we humbly pray. And do thou, o Prince of the Heavenly Host, by the power of God, thrust into hell Satan and all the evil spirits who prowl about the world, seeking the ruin of souls. Amen. That's it for this week. We will be back again next week with another edition of Faith on Trial. In the meantime, make sure you go to church and take your kids. Our freedom of conscience and religion is being challenged by laws and regulations imposed by secular society. Faith on Trial with Defender of the Faith, Deacon Mike Mano. Faith on Trial on Iowa Catholic Radio, iowacatholicradio.com, and the Iowa Catholic Radio app. Support for Faith on Trial and Iowa Catholic Radio provided in part by Imaging Ingredients.